Uh, my name is Jolie Lucas, like Angelina Jolie without the millions or the Angelina. And I'm an instrument rated commercial pilot. I have a 1965 E model Mooney, and I'm working on my multi engine rating. I'll have this slide up at the end of the presentation as well. So if you'd like to connect, you can take pictures of the slides. If there's something that you would like to take a picture of while I'm speaking, please just go ahead and take photos. That's great. Uh, Meredy is helping me be my assistant, and so she's going to be taking some photos with the winners of the door prizes and such. So first of all, I want to tell you a little something that happened to me in 2003 in Hood River, Oregon at Ken Jernstead Field. Ken was one of the Flying Tigers, and uh, it, it's for Sierra 2, and we were uh, taking off. It was airport day. It was a beautiful 70-degree day. And uh, the elevation there is about 631. And as I mentioned, it was airport day. Uh, the night before, we had our jazz band play for the barbecue. My son and my mom were on the ground. And my daughter, my father, and I, and her boyfriend were headed down to Eugene, Oregon. Go Ducks. It's hard to make an O with the microphone in my hand. And again, it was a calm day. My flight instructor was giving scenic rides right behind me. And uh, my DPE was there on the field, probably a couple hundred folks there. And you can see the red arrow and the green arrow right by Hood River. And the plan was to take off and make a right crosswind. And with the river, you fly it like a road. So I was going to fly down the Columbia River Gorge to Eugene. It was going to be about a 40-minute flight. And when you're flying down a river, it's just like a road, so you fly on the right side. But what ended up happening was uh, an engine failure on takeoff. And this is what it looked like. So when I knew that we weren't going to fly, I cut the throttle, pitched up into a landing flare, and we started taking out trees about 50 miles an hour. We ended up upside down in a mud pond, and then the trees fell on top of us. The tail was twisted almost completely around. When we hit the last tree, we fell backwards into the canopy and then flipped over, so it turned the tail around. And uh, some people ask me why I only will own a Mooney. <laughs> And this was at 11 a.m. And at 7 p.m., we were barbecuing steaks. All of us walked out with very, very little injuries. That's my dad. And he's picking branches out of the tail. And that's me thinking that it was something I did or did not do that caused the accident. So it's, this subject is near and dear to me because I had done all the planning. I'm a planner by nature. I only have three out of the five OCD characteristics, but those three keep me safe. And so not knowing what caused the accident was very stressful because it was my dad's Mooney, and I felt like something I did or didn't do took it away from him. So at that point, I decided that I was going to dedicate part of my life to aviation safety seminars. And what I love to do is combine the psychology of life with the psychology of flight. So that's what we're going to do today. It's just a discussion. If you have questions or comments, we can wait till the end. Or if you have something that you'd like to say, you can say it, except for heckling. So. This, this happened just uh, last month. Well, no, this month, actually. I was down at Oceano Airport. It's an airport that is very close to the Pacific Ocean. And I am one of the volunteers, friends of Oceano Airport. And a fellow came up to me and said, do you know anything about the fuel pumps? And I said, well, you know, the 
they're just regular fuel pumps. And they, he said, I can't get the card reader to work. And he had flown in from Los Angeles about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. And what we, I went and looked at it, and there was no power to the card reader. So he couldn't get fuel. And I said, well, San Luis is just eight miles that way. So you can see on the map, here's Oceano, there's San Luis, and that's eight nautical miles. And he said to me, I don't know if I have enough fuel to get to San Luis Obispo. So I thought, I am so glad that I'm doing this presentation. So we're going to focus on the, the psychology of personal flight minimums or guidelines. And I don't want you to think about IFR minimums. We're not necessarily talking about that. But we're going to be talking about why we make our guidelines, how we commit to them. We have all fudged on our guidelines, our personal guidelines and what we learn from them and what we hope never to experience. So for co folks that are coming in to listen, please come and get a door, door prize coupon and uh, you might win a wonderful door prize. So come in, have a seat, we'll get you a red coupon. And Brian had, well, Brian's not there anymore or he's changed a little bit. Um, Brian had the, <laughs> the idea that we should put a ring on it. You know, when we're committed to something, we put a ring on it. So. Uh, that's what we're going to do with our personal minimums. So we're going to cover minimums in regard to the pilot, the airplane, and the environment. And what I decided to do, this was originally an article series for AOPA, and I interviewed, um, I guess it was about 13 folks that ranged from private pilots, student pilots, on up to 20,000 hours. And one of the DPEs said to me that I interviewed when we were talking about our guidelines and our minimums, he said, the idea is how far can I get my head in that alligator's mouth and still be able to pull it out? So we want to make sure we never get bit by thinking that the rules don't apply to us. So I have to tell you that you're not special. There's a part of us that thinks that the rules don't apply to us, and that's incorrect. Um, your mother thinks you're special, but you're not. When we're talking about coming up with these guidelines, I'm going to be the enemy of fun for a little bit to talk about keeping you safe and in the airplane. Whether you're and do we have non-pilots? Okay, awesome. And is this your pilot here? So your right seat, you sit in the right seat, yeah. And this is a great workshop because it's going to be for you and for your left seat pilot. So I'm glad you're here. So as again, as I said, we had student pilots all the way up to the 20,000 hour pilots. And you know what I, and these are some of the airplanes that the people flow, flew or fly that I interviewed. <clears throat> you might recognize some as the time goes on. What I found out was between the 200-hour pilots and the 20,000-hour pilots, it was me and the 20,000-hour pilots who had their minimums written down, had their personal guidelines written down. And in between was the haze. Yeah, I, I kind of did that when I was you know, an uh, instrument pilot student when I got my private pilot. How many of you have your minimums written down? Oh my Lord, that's awesome. That makes me happy. So what I ask them is, do they have a, a current set of personal minimums? Are they written down? Do you ever look at them? So when you're 200 hour pilot, have you, you know, and now you're 750, have you looked at them? Are they updated? Do you review them? Do you change them? I also ask them for two things. A pucker factor, we all know what that is, right? Something that makes you go, oh, that doesn't feel good. Or a hidden gem, something that they learned that they could share with me so that I could share in the written form in the article series and then as well in the presentation series. 
So if you only remember one thing today from what I say, it's to realistically look at your skill set and then round down. 70% of drivers think they're above average drivers. And AOPA does have some good VFR and IFR templates, but I think that it's better to even be more specific with yourself. And we're going to be talking more about the psychology of it because there's a part of our brain that I want to tell you about that thinks that we can be sneaky. So one of the hidden gems came from uh, a lovely airline captain and 182 pilot. And what he said was to never change your personal minimums for a single flight. If you start monkeying around with your minimums, thinking I can get away with this, it's going to be OK, it's going to bite you in the kazuba one of these days. They're not really minimums if you start flexing them around. Ah, that's what I flew to Oshkosh in. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about your airplane that you're going to be in. So remember, we're covering airplane factors, pilot factors, and environmental factors. I think it's safe to say that we are probably flying a little bit less than we have in the past couple of years. So when you're looking at your airplane, uh, do any of you know, I mean, do, you, are, do we have aircraft owners in here as well? Okay. So, we, so do we know our crosswind component, what we're comfortable with, long runway, short runway? Look at uh, how much fuel do you want to have on landing? That's, that's an interesting thing when you consider the fellow that didn't have enough fuel for eight nautical mile flight. What's the runway condition? What minimums do you have about a runway condition? And uh, you know what would you do if there was a mag failure? Would you still go? So as I said, most likely we haven't been flying quite as much due to the pandemic and price of fuel, maybe. So I want you to check out your airplane. Uh, when we landed at, La at Oshkosh last year, I didn't know this till now, but there was a bird in our cowling. <laughs> A dead one, but uh, so so I want you to check out your airplanes. You know, any little mice going on? Yeah, uh, what what do your tires look like? You know, if you have a plane and a hangar, all that stuff. And also, what does your maintenance schedule be like? If you're coming in, please come in. We'd love to have you. Make sure you get a red ticket for the door prizes. And there's a lovely steerman that is on the field at Oceano. So what we see are some of the quotes from the people that I interviewed. And, um, and the top one was interesting because he's a Mooney pilot and, an, and uh, an FO for SkyWest. His minimum is landing with an hour and three quarters of fuel. And, and I thought that was really interesting because a lot of us think, ah, oh, 30 minutes to an hour. And he said an hour and 30, you know, an hour and, and uh, 75. So, you know, that's, that's a, lot of, a lot of fuel. But he lives in the Denver area. And he says, if I have to divert, you know, I might need to go quite a ways. Um, the other one that I thought was fun was the, second, the third one down that says, if he lands and, uh, you know, something's not working uh, as far as the fuel pumps or such, that he won't leave until he gets fuel. If there's a reason you've landed for fuel, get it. Get it. All right, let's talk a little bit about pilot factors. And that's where we're going to focus a bunch of our time. And that um, airplane was at Mason City, Iowa recently. I think I have resting pilot face. <laughs> you know, um, when I'm flying, I'm super focused and not chatty and and so in the category of the rules apply to you if you have financial concerns health concerns things that are going on psychologically we're going to talk a little bit about stress burnout and compassion fatigue because they are three distinctly different things 
And um, I know I'm the enemy of fun today, and that's okay as long as it keeps you guys safe. But I want you to ask yourself, is this flight worth my life? Because you know, nobody thinks uh, that they're going to end up having a problem. When I took off from Hood River with my daughter and my father, I never assumed that we would be upside down in a pond with trees all over us. So you just ask yourself, am I okay? And we're going to be focused on that. And I know, I'm, I know I'm not sounding like a lot of fun. So there's three different things that we want to cover here. Stress, compassion, fatigue, and burnout. And stress is the physiological response to your environment. Um, stress, in a nutshell, if you're stressed, you're going to feel wound up. It's going to feel more like anxiety. So you're going to have some of those physiological things, like uh, your heart rate's going to be up, your respirations are going to be up, you might be a little sweaty, and that's the stress response. And prolonged stress is the problem. Acute stress isn't a problem. If we're driving along and you see a deer coming out into the road, you want your fight, flight, and freeze going. You want that adrenaline to slam on the brakes to not hit Bambi. But we are not, as humans, we are not made for chronic stress. It, it burns out our adrenals and it makes us have shorter lives. So again, nutshell with stress wound up. Okay? Have any of you heard of compassion fatigue? Yes? <laughs> Especially if you've been taking care of somebody or, um, you know, with the pandemic, we've had folks that have gotten sick. Compassion fatigue is really the cost of caring. So when we're taking care of somebody and trying to put their best interest first, we can get uh, just tired and a little bit wound down. And I, I noticed, you know, with my work, I've been a psychotherapist for 30 years, and so I have a thriving counseling practice. And I have to tell you that the last two years have been a lot, a lot, because I, I have my own feelings about the pandemic, about the economy, about social justice or politics. And then I have to put that aside to work with my clients. And it's the first time they've talked about those things. And it's the sixth time today that I've listened to it. So for me, this compassion fatigue, as an empathetic person and a sensitive person, you know, it does, it does start to affect us. Now, burnout. Most people think that burnout has to do with your job, right? So they, well, I, you know, I like my job. Oops, sorry, got standing in the blue. I was going toward the light. Oh, I'm not quite ready to go yet. So well, let's talk a little bit about burnout because it could be relationships. It can be your job. It can be something to do with flying. What I want you to remember with burnout is it feels wound down. Stress feels wound up and burnout feels wound down. So in the context of your work, it tends to happen when your values might not line up with your, the corporate values of where you're working. And you can see from the screen that we start to feel like we don't have a great sense of accomplishment or engagement. So we can get a little disillusioned. So when we're thinking about pilot factors, and, and I don't know who I was talking to about the I'm safe, which is a great acronym, right? But that doesn't hit this stuff. This is, we need to be thinking about that. You know, do I feel wound up? Do I feel wound down? Do I feel like I can't care anymore? Because if I keep caring, I get too depressed and I get too sad and it hurts me. And again, I'm sorry to be so direct with you all, but I want to make sure that you all are very safe when you're flying. Alrighty, so we're gonna have sound on this one. So, uh, this quote is from me as pilot in command. The goal is every action in the airplane is performed with forethought 
and intentionality. So we have this really low part of our ancient brain called the amygdala. It's about the size of an almond. For men, your amygdala is bigger. Women, ours is smaller. So it houses four Fs, fight, flight, freeze, well, and fornicate. <laughs> so that, that, that explains why with the males that that fourth F is one of their drives to uh, procreate, let's say. So what we don't want to be doing in the airplane is making decisions with a part of our brain that we share with reptiles, dogs, cats, right, horses. We want to make sure that we're using this front part of our brain that we don't share with animals. That's the ability to synthesize information, to say, if I do this, well, maybe this will happen or that'll happen. And maintaining perspective is a big, big part of this. So we're going to watch a fun video. And it's all about maintaining perspective. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most, is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. But well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. See, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go on? I love that. It's all my sweaters are snagged. <laughs> I can't sleep. And he, I love his, the look on his face. Um, one thing I haven't said is males are organized around being competent. So your personality structures, your life are built typically around knowing what to do, what's the procedure, I want to be competent, really good with checklists. And um, females are built around connection. And we want to be connected to others. So if I talk to uh, a man and, and who wants to schedule an appointment, and I'll say, well, how about Wednesday at 3? And that's easily accessed for him. Yes, I can do Wednesday at 3. And if I asked a female, how about Wednesday at 3? Wednesday at 3. Okay, well, it's yoga night. It's at 7. i got to pick up some dry cleaning, and, and then, you know, and then we got to start dinner. It's all this series of connections. And so... What I loved about what he was doing was he was trying to fix the problem. And most men have that lovely part of their personality, which they don't want someone to suffer. They want to fix the problem. They want to repair things. And she just wanted to be heard. So anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. Loss affects all of us, and then we should put it on our che checklist. He had uh, his dad die. He had a relationship breakup. And he also lost a friend who passed away. And so there he was up at the flight level, you know, in a two pilot operation. And he's looking at the controls and going, I shouldn't be flying. Loss affects us all. Remember, that's in the compassion fatigue 
we've all had a lot of loss in the couple last couple of years. So I thought that was a really good point, was that we should have that on our personal checklist. Like, how am I doing? And this was one of our student. he was an IFR student, and, and he was talking about fatigue, that he was going up for a lesson, he wasn't sleeping very well, and he just performed horribly, in his words. So make sure that you're sleeping. The average person in a sleep lab sleeps seven to eight hours at night. Of course, in a sleep lab, you don't know if it's day or night. And there's a, usually a one to two hour nap between 2 and 4 p.m. So, I mean, how m I'm still waking up before 6 when I don't, oh, I have, I have that one too for the Oregon Ducks. But what I'm saying about sleep is to make sure that you're sleeping well. You really need seven hours. And I know you don't think the rules apply to you, but they do. Okay, here's another one. I'm the most important factor in the equation. Not if my passengers need to get there or I'm going for a business meeting. I have to pay attention to have I been eating? Have I been sleeping? You know, have I been drinking a lot of fluids? Um, I, I think it's important for you to figure that part out for yourself. Now, the right seat non-pilot yet, we need more girl pilots, by the way. Um, you know, you might be able to see things in your left seat pilot that he or she can't see. We're, we're not very good at the mirror, right, at, at holding up a mirror because, again, we think we're special. I remember after my dad died suddenly in 2015 and he was my aviation hero and my hero in life, and he died very unexpectedly, and I remember um, talking to my teaching partner, Jan Maxwell, and, and the funeral was coming up, and it was like an hour and 20 minute flight in the Mooney, something that I've flown a lot, and it's a five hour drive. And she called me up and she goes, how you doing with losing your dad? Uh-oh. And I said, I wonder if I'm okay to fly. Have you ever asked yourself that? If you ask yourself, I wonder if I'm okay to fly, what do you guys think? You're not. I'm not. So just get real with yourself. And I heard myself say it. And in, in the years since, if I start thinking that, I wonder if I'm okay to fly. I don't fly. I had a five-hour drive with my son. It was great. Stopped at Harris Ranch, which is a big, wonderful meat-producing uh, restaurant and deli, and we got some good steaks. So let's talk planning. So now we've gone from the airplane and the pilot to the planning. And that's my Mooney, Maggie. And like I said, I'm a pretty big planner. So there's two types of environments that, as pilots that we need to be considering. So we have the strategic environment and the tactical environment. And both are equally important. So the strategic is what you're doing on the ground, right? And, what, and, the, and the tactical is what Mother Nature tells you what the airplane tells you, what the airport tells you. So when you're thinking about your minimums, you should be looking at, and this was my route to Oshkosh a while ago. I love Borger, Texas. Borger, Texas has the Texas Rose Steakhouse. And they have the former cop cars that you get to borrow to go in to the hotel and to the Texas Rose Steakhouse. Just a handy tip. So when you're on the ground, you're going to be looking all these things that we know, right? You're looking at weather. You're looking at your routes. You're looking at terrain. You're, you're trying to figure out with the conditions that are going on, what does this airport need to look at like for me to land? And you're looking at the facilities. So that's all this stuff on the ground. And then this is what happens in real life. Right? So 
the weather's not what it's supposed to be. The winds aren't what it's supposed to be. I developed a headache part way through. I didn't sleep good the night before, and I still flew. I'm not saying I like me, but I like you. Uh, yesterday, runway 36 here was closed because a little bird dog decided to take a ground loop. So the runway that you want at your destination airport might not be available. And uh, so this is really reality-based and fluid. This is where we want the high part of our brain on board. This frontal part, it's a wonderful part of our brain. Because what happens at first is something bad happens, and we go to that little part down here, we go to freeze, like, oh, crud. And when, you, when someone's brain goes on freeze, their eyes freeze. So in, in counseling, when I'm working with somebody and their brain goes on freeze, it's like. So and initially, that's what happens. But then we need to get the front part up that goes, OK. OK, sis, now what? I call myself sis when I fly. So now what? What are you going to do? You want to make sure that you've had your planning on the ground, but that you're responding to what's going on in the air. And that was last year's storm, not this year's. I love this term. I hadn't really heard it before, but it's called the normalization of deviance. And this is one of my 20,000 hour airline, former airline captain pilots that said that he had a hard limit flying the decathlon, you know, VFR only, that he had, and he would fly it to his air, you know, airplane gigs. And he said, I have to have 1,500 feet on my altimeter or I'm going to turn around. But you know what happened? 1,450. Then what happened? 1,400. And what we do is we normalize the deviance. So know that that's a brain thing that we do, right? And, and stop it. They, there needs to be hard limits. I know uh, you're looking at me like, I thought this was going to be fun. OK, so here's some pucker factors that came from my interviewees. And we'll need sound for this. <laughs> it, it's so funny how it's just like, I'm Mike Jesh, and here's my pucker factor situation. I was flying on my way back from Oshkosh a couple of years ago from Wayne, Nebraska, uh, back to Southern California, and our goal for the day was to land in Grand Junction, Colorado. Now, this is late afternoon and a late July day on the way home from Oshkosh, and there was weather starting to pop over the Colorado mountains, the, the Rocky Mountains. And so we knew this was going to be a little bit of a sticky situation. And my passenger, who was also a flight instructor, a fairly high time pilot, and I made a few decisions ahead of time before we got underway. Uh, we knew that we were going to be flying into this weather, and we knew that we were going through the mountains, and mountains and weather isn't always a very good situation. So the, the first decision point we established was at uh, Boulder, Colorado. And we determined there that our, our plan A, of course, is our original destination in mind, which was Grand Junction. Our plan B would be Fort Collins, Colorado. And I had a friend who lived there who had offered to put us up for the night. So this is what I would call a solid gold plan B. And uh, then we set another one later on that I'll, I'll get to in a moment. So we flew across western Nebraska and northeastern Colorado and into Boulder. And as we were approaching the Rollins Pass just west of Boulder, we came to our first decision point. And the criteria that we had established were that we needed to be able to see clearly to the other side of the mountain range and make sure that we could then get to the other side safely and, and be legal and safe on the way. And if not, then we would instantly turn around. And so we get to Boulder and that's exactly the situation we found. We had to deviate around a little bit of weather, but when we got to the pass, we could clearly see the other side of the pass. The ceilings were, were great and the visibility was great. So we continued on. And we followed the mountain roads again down toward Eagle, Colorado, which was our second major decision point. And the plan C was to land at Eagle if we couldn't continue. And again, our minimum weather requirements were that we be able to see the continued route along I-70 over toward Rifle and then on into Grand Junction. And if not, then we would land at Eagle and spend the night there. 
So as we proceeded down, uh, I forget which freeway it was, but we get to Eagle and uh, everything looked good. So we continued along toward Rifle and then uh, followed the road down toward Grand Junction. And this all worked out great. So it, I like to avoid pucker factor type situations. And the, way, the key to surviving a, a pucker factor situation is to identify your options early and identify what your minimum parameters are going to be when you get to the point where you have to make these decisions. And when you set it up like this, you're not in the air trying to figure out what your options are. You already know what your options are. And then it's just a simple matter to make the choice of door A or door B. And with these options and with the parameters clearly defined, there's no guesswork, there's no gray area. The decision is either A or B and you move along your way. And that's exactly as it, it worked out. It, our flight visibility did get a little bit low between Rifle and Grand Junction, but we were legal and we were safe at all times and we always kept an open door to good weather. So if you're ever faced with a pucker factor situation, hopefully uh, first thing you can identify that you're entering this situation early and then you can explore your options, determine what your options are, and establish your set of criteria uh, that you're going to need to meet to make. And then you have to be willing to execute on that. When you get to that point, if you don't see the conditions that are going to work for you, you have to make that decision right then to turn around. There's not going to be any time for waffling or trying to figure something out at that point. You should already have made those decisions. So I hope this helps you. Uh, maintain your uh, safety in, in your future flying should you ever be faced with a pucker factor situation. Make the best of it, plan ahead, think ahead, make your decisions, and be willing to make them. And that was Mike Josh. He was my uh, CFII, and he was my instructor for my commercial. And, I, and he's over 20,000 hours. I really liked how he just did all that tactical strategic planning on the ground and then when he's in the air you can make those decisions come in sit down get a door prize coupon we got about 10 minutes left so this is a pucker factor in las vegas anybody fly into vegas there's uh, some general aviation airports there as well as the big airport and this was a mooney pilot and and what i really appreciate about the folks that i interviewed was they were able to tell me their pucker factors right so that means i have to own up to it that I did something I don't ever want to do again. And what he did here was uh, he was flying towards some rising terrain. He was kind of trying to cut the gap to go into Henderson Field, which is one of the feeders from Las Vegas. And the ceilings were going down and down. So he was going down and down. And then he's in this pass. And he's flying through the pass, which is down here by the red arrow, and headed that way. And what he thought was, I can't turn around if I wanted to. So it was a pinch factor. And again, it's, well, the rules don't apply to me. Well, the rules don't apply to me. Oh, crud. The rules are applying to me. It ended up well, but he said, I'll never do it again. I, I admire that. You know, especially when a guy can say he's wrong, that's a big deal because they're based on competence. So if you tell a girl she's wrong, she goes, oh, yeah, I know. You tell a guy he's wrong, he's like, no, I'm not. It's like, yeah, you are. You got a nail in your forehead. Hi, my name is JJ Greenway. I wanted to tell you about a, a tight spot I got myself into flying that ranks right up there in my five top tight spots, I suppose you could say, uh, that I've gotten myself into in uh, 40 years of professional flying. It was a little more than 20 years ago, January 16th, 1998. I was a captain on the MD-80, and I was not new to the aviation. I had nearly 9,200 hours total time and had been flying for 25 years or so. I was uh, scheduled to fly between Dallas-Fort Worth and Portland, Oregon. Last flight of the day, flight 347. Beautiful evening. Uh, Texas was completely clear. The Rocky Mountains were clear. It was even clear on the west side of the Cascades in Portland. And terminal area forecast for every station along the way was clear skies. Winds were rather benign, less than 10 knots. Beautiful evening for flying. We proceeded uh, uneventfully out of uh, DFW. We were completely full, 142 passengers, and we had full fuel. Not full fuel, but enough fuel for uh, our alternate and legal reserves. 
We checked in with Fort Worth Center and it became evident right away that the rides at our filed altitude were very poor. We were filed in the low 30s and we were right away hearing complaints from airliners and anyone else that was up in the 30 to 40,000 foot range that the rides were moderate chop to moderate turbulence. And it was a nearly four hour flight and I didn't want to subject the passengers to that. So I consulted with a dispatcher on the radio and we agreed that we could uh, cut into our alternate fuel because we did not legally need an alternate and we could cruise at a lower altitude burning much more fuel and still have enough fuel to be legal when we got to Portland. We requested and received flight level 220 and proceeded up across the Rocky Mountains under a nearly full moon and it was a beautifully smooth ride. It was a fastened seatbelt sign was off for the entire trip. We could see the snow-capped peaks over the Rockies in the in the full moon and uh, it was a rather enjoyable trip. We started our descent uh, up just west of Baker, Oregon, Baker City, Oregon, and uh, we could see the lights of Portland coming into view. The controller came on when we were about 45 miles out of Portland and said that it looked like there was a severe thunderstorm coming up overhead the field and two flights ahead of us had gone missed approach and what were our intentions. Looking at our fuel, taking a quick glance at it, we really didn't have much choice. We couldn't hold and wait it out. Um, I didn't feel like we had enough uh, fuel to shoot the approach and miss the approach and then go to an alternate. So we decided right away to uh, request a diversion to Seattle, about 30 minutes north of Portland. So we headed right towards Seattle. We were cleared and we flew up. Good visibility in Seattle. Uh, it was raining as usual. Ceilings were decent. We did the ILS approach and landed uneventfully on runway 16 right in Seattle. Landed with 38 minutes of fuel on board, which still bothers me to think about, let alone talk about in public. That's a lot less fuel than I would like to land with in any airplane. Lesson learned for me though was that we always have to plan for the unexpected. Um, airports close because of weather, they close because of wind being out of limits. Um, I had an airport in Mexico close on me when I was on the approach because there was a severe earthquake and they weren't sure of the um, capability of the runway, if the runway had been cracked or damaged in any way. Um, flying in Southeast Asia several years ago, I uh, encountered an airport that closed because of political reasons during a regime change. Um, disabled aircraft on the runway has closed airports that I was inbound to and, and made me divert to another airport. So I think we always have to plan for the unexpected, uh, even when things look really good with, uh, with a forecast that's completely clear and winds that are calm like I had in Portland, Oregon that night. Uh, when I cut my fuel down that far, in retrospect, I probably should have taken an altitude that was uncomfortable in the low 30s and been up there suffering with everyone else and uh, landed with, or at least arrived over the Portland area with a lot more fuel than I arrived with. So, lesson learned for me. Uh, I vowed to never get myself into a situation like that again, but I also vowed to always plan for the unexpected uh, when I'm flying. I hope you do the same. What a good point. This is a brief uh, biker factor from a DPE that was going into Pearson Field up in the Pacific Northwest. It's sort of a cutout airspace-wise of Portland International Airport. And um, what he had was he was flying and the minimums kept going down and down and down and down and he kept going down and down and down. And as he landed, he thought, what kind of an example am I giving to the student that's on the ground waiting for me? That I'm violating my personal minimums right there. Oh, we've got some guy talking. So we got the volume up. This is a, this is a really great pucker factor, so everybody listen up. Hi, my name is Brian Schiff. Back when I was in college, a friend and I were asked if we could ferry a Cessna 310 from Tulsa, Oklahoma to San Jose, California. This would involve missing a few days of class, but we were very eager to get the extra eight to 10 hours of multi-engine time in our logbooks, so we agreed to do it. This also meant missing a class that was Human Factors 101. 
Ironically, we learned more about human factors in this two days of flying the Cessna 310 than we ever would in a semester-long class. As we were flying westbound, an eastbound cold front was racing us to the Rocky Mountain. Whoa. All that, all that strategic planning I did with this workshop. Hmm. And now I'm having to do some tactical planning. Good thing you had a backup plan. I know. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain <laughs> Brian Schiff. <laughs> so there I was. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is before I got my dream job. I'm in that hour building phase of my career. I'll take any flying you give me. I'll ferry an airplane from uh, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, all the way back to the Bay Area. This one happened to be a Cessna 310, and we thought, wow, multi-engine time. Someone else is paying for it. There's no reason I can't do this. I want to do it. And so a friend and I agreed to it to, to get that coveted multi-engine time. And when we departed, you know, we pre-flighted the airplane, and one generator wasn't quite doing what it should. But hey, there's another one, and I fly single-engine airplanes with one generator, so what's wrong with that? Uh, we, we wound up going anywhere. The owner of this airplane, by the way, wanted it tomorrow. You know, I want to get it back here as soon as possible. So now we got the E and PAVE, the external pressures, and, and, and I want to get it here as soon as I can. And if we would have put it off any longer, there was also a cold front racing its way toward the Rocky Mountains from the west. We're coming from the east. So if we wouldn't have got there quickly, we would have had to wait for this cold front to pass. And that could have cost us a couple days, because that for sure would have been bad enough to keep me on the ground, as if nothing else would. And, and so we started flying, and it was this time in uh, the 89, I think early 89, when there was a really bad dust storms all over Texas, super strong winds aloft. Uh, westerly flow, so we were flying in really strong headwinds, really strong turbulence. This airplane, you couldn't fly with the autopilot with that much turbulence. It would just kick off anyway, and it wouldn't do a good job. So uh, my, luckily, there were two of us. But we had blisters on our hands. We had headaches. We were tired. We were fatigued. We had to get up so high just to, uh, and there was no GPS back then. Uh, we, you know, the you are here thing, we had to use VORs. I can't even spell that anymore. And so we're going across the Rockies, getting flight following with up and down drafts to the point. Oh, by the way, we'll go at night. That way we can avoid uh, you know, this storm and get out past the Rockies before the storm hits. So one generator at night, headaches, fatigued. And, uh, and here we are trying to get this airplane back for this guy. We could have still got the same number of hours. If it took us two weeks to get there, we'd still get the eight hours. Uh, but we succumbed to the external pressures, and we pushed on. And at one point, we got to where the up and down drafts were so strong that at VYSC, you know, VY in the, in the twin, full power were descending down into the Rockies at night, wondering. We got so high at one point in the updraft, and my buddy, I heard him pulling the power back when I was asleep. And I said, what are you doing? We're almost there. And he goes, no, it's just a big updraft. I said, oh, God, take it. So pour on the coals, take the updraft, because on the other side of it, it's going to be a downdraft. And sure enough, the other side of it was a downdraft. And then we got the, uh, the thing you never want to hear from ATC when you're descending on, uh, against your will at night with one generator over the Rockies. Uh, wait, they said, uh, uh, radar contact lost, squawk 1200, have a nice day, frequency change approved. I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, so right, unable, they said unable, they couldn't, you know, we were below the radar. We weren't receiving the VOR that we had tuned in, and so we're dead reckoning with a VF with sectional at night, luckily just enough moonlight to illuminate the peaks that were above us on the left and the right, and just, just tweaking and as I tell this, I'm puckering, and it was stupid. It w yeah, <laughs> it was stupid, and, and I'll never do it again. And so uh, setting personal minimums after that became very easy. If you've ever kissed the ground after you landed, uh, you will definitely set some personal minimums so as to never get into that situation. From then on, it's got to be everything in my favor. I don't go. And I have personal minimums. I, I consider them like my policy. It's hard ironclad, and I have signed it, and I've given it to somebody else. I said, if I ever ball it up and end up killing myself or somebody else, you take this to court, and then whatever lawsuit ensues, and say, he broke his minimums. 
and I keep that in mind, and that's what keeps me on top of it, is having uh, accountability from somebody else. But anyway, don't ever do that. Stick to your minimums. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. That's a great story. Okay, so we've talked about a lot. And don't forget that we have about seven door prizes to, ha to hand out, and you have to be here to win. So put a ring on your minimums, your guidelines. Make the commitment to them. Take the extra step to write them down. You need to update them out now and then with your experience level in the airplanes that you're flying. And just commit to yourself that you're always going to fly using those minimums. And um, as I said, I'm a psychotherapist. And right now, I have a special on coaching if you're interested in personal coaching. It's something that I love to do, uh, helping people to have a happier and healthier life. And if you're interested, just let me know afterwards. So this is the, the contact information. I love to have conversations with folks. So if you'd like to reach me uh, through my website, which is joelielucas.com, or my email, it's up there. You can take a picture of that if you like.